On behalf of my colleagues in the colloquium committee, Sonny Marotero, Kimberly Watson, Nia Iman Smith, we wish to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University Bloomington is built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. In addition, to make this statement less performative, I commit myself to every time that I say it to donating about 20 to 25 dollars every time. I invite you, but you, you don't, are not required to, but my colleague in ethnomusicology, Renata Yazi, has founded and directed this American Indian Music Scholarship, and we would welcome your donations. So I'd like to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Dorian Juric. Dr. Juric received his PhD in 2019 in anthropology at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. This academic year, Dr. Juric is our visiting assistant professor in the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology. He was born and raised in the interior of British Columbia, the son of a Croatian immigrant who taught himself Bosnian, Croatian, Montenegrin, and several Serbian languages to conduct his folklore research. Dr. Juric's research explores the political life of oral traditions, oral epic, supernatural legends, and conspiracy theories in historical and contemporary Western Balkans. He has mastered the Gusla, the Gusla, is it the Gusla? Oh yeah, it's the, the master Gusla. part of the <laughs> Master, the Gusla. And you can see it proudly displayed on his wall in the office, which is a traditional string musical instrument from the Balkans that the epic songs are sung, are, the epic songs are sung to. However, he claims he has yet to master singing the epic songs. Lastly, and most importantly, he is the proud father of daughters, so please help me welcome Dr. Dorian Yudic. Hi. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. There's so many of you for me to put to sleep now. Um, this is an extremely sort of context-specific talk, uh, and I'm sure you're not all Balkanists and South Slavicists. So I've done my best over the last few days to try to add things to the talk that will make it a little easier to understand. Uh, but you'll have to forgive that uh, there's a couple maps I made like yesterday and they looked awful. So, my talk is called uh, Bringing Back Bakwanya, Epic Geography and the Editor's Imperative. So, this song would be good if it were not so unnecessarily long. <laughs> Although about 200 verse lines have been excised, this is the longest of all songs known to date. I could forgive him all the repetition and all the stretching out with nice language and diction, but I cannot forgive the transference of Bachwani and the Danube in this song. The singer has also heard some Hungarian songs and then transferred those features over from those songs. The transcriber would need to admonish him for this. Then the singer himself would surely desist. The transcriber collector must, as much as is possible, guide the singer to the correct telling, train him. I was not in Lepoglava where the singer was imprisoned, so I could not do it. <laughs> Mr. M. Krizhevic is not an experienced collector. This is a quote from Dr. Luka Marjanovic, written in June 1889. Uh, so this is, um, this is one of the many editorial notes written by the Croatian lawyer and ethnographer Luka Marjanovic, and I, uh, appended to the archival manuscript containing songs collected from the Bosniak epic singer Ahmed Ceausevic. When I say Bosniak, it just means he's a Muslim from Bosnia. Uh, there are some parallels in the lives of Luka Marjanovic and Ahmed Ceausevic. This is not actually Ahmed Ceausevic. We have no pictures, so I made one. <laughs> Uh, humble peasant roots and grew up in the Dinaric Alps, surrounded by an active tradition of oral epic singing. Both were born in the frontier lands that divided the Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires. So uh, these are modern borders, but at this time, this is uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire and this is the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and there was a military frontier that ran pretty much along where the border is today. Oh, also I'll note here, 
that this upper corner of Bosnia is referred to as the Kraina, which just means the frontier, and I'm going to be using that quite a bit. We're going to learn some terminology today. As the crow flies, Marjanovic's hometown of Zavalje is only separated from Čaučevic's Brekovica by 12.6 kilometers. Both villages are perched about 400 meters above sea level on mountains overlooking the city of Bihać. Uh, and at the age of 19, both men left their home villages and journeyed to the heartland of the Croatian nation, where their shared connection to oral epic singing brought them into contact. The resemblances of their stories, however, ceased there. For Marjanovic, it was years of earnest study, sacrifices made by his family, support from his local diocese, and opportunities afforded to exceptional students in the military frontier that allowed him to leave Zavalje to pursue an education throughout Croatia and Austria before settling as a respected scholar, professor, and socialite in Zagreb. Ceausevic, on the other hand, was forcibly removed from Bosnia and Brekovica by imperial gendarmes uh, for an unknown crime, tried in Sarajevo, and transported to the Croatian prison in Lepoglava, 45 kilometers north of Zagreb. It was a unique folklore collection project conceived and executed by Marjanovic and including Ceausevic that brought the two together. Unfortunately, their dissimilar social backgrounds also reflected an aesthetic divide between an oral singer working within a system of traditional folk practice and a scholar who, despite his best intentions, approached the songs from a high cultural and rationalist position. As the opening quote attests, Marjanovic found a number of problems with Ceausevic's songs. Oh. What is curious in the quoted passage is that stylistic concerns are superseded by those of a geographic nature. Why was the transposition of a mountain cause for such a rebuke? To answer these questions, I have used historical ethnographic and archival research to uncover the largely forgotten and elusive historical figure of Ahmed Ceausevic. I have returned to Marjanovic's collecting project, which itself is surprisingly unexplored and poorly documented in academic literature, to understand the logics that undergirded his fieldwork and editorial process. I have also returned to the somewhat neglected research topic of epic geography and brought support to Dr. Daniel Pryor's assertion that place names and itineraries warrant nomination to a status near that of epithets and other formulae in the set of comparative tools available to epic scholars. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Dan Pryor wrote this paper while he was actually a, still a PhD student in our department, uh, but unfortunately for me, he got to ride a horse to follow his epic geography, and unfortunately it's not that possible in the Balkans to do that anymore. Horses don't really like um, European superhighways funded by Germany. <laughs> and finally, in 2022, my family and I rented a car. Here they are, all stuffed into a small European vehicle. My fairly newborn second daughter there just snoozing away with a bathtub over her head. Um, <laughs> And we trace Ceausevic's epic itineraries in real life. So let's go back 137 years. In 1886, Marjanovic began an extensive collection project funded by the publishing house Matica Hrvatska and aimed at bringing the voices of their brothers of the Mohammedan faith in the Bosnian Kraina to its Croatian folk songs publications. A lot of you might know, if you know anything about uh, epic singing, you might know the collections of Vuk Stefanovic Karadzic. Um, and uh, not long after his work really became published in a big way, the Croatians, uh, who had had a number of their songs sort of adopted as Serbian songs in his collection, uh, embarked on their own collecting in their own native lands and made a ten-volume set, although they also then went into Bosnia and played the same game. <laughs> In the spring of 1886, Marjanovic enlisted a merchant friend of his from the city of Bihać to track down Muslim singers. In July of the same year, that merchant's trade brought him to Zagreb and he carried with him a present for Marjanovic, a song he had transcribed from the singer Mehmed Kolak Kolakovic, uh, Muhammadan Sachistikarvi, a uh, pure blood Mohammedan, from the town of Orashats, which is just a little bit south of Bihać. With a contact made, and news of the project spreading in the frontier, Marjanovic recruited friends, students, and colleagues as transcribers and embarked on the first truly scientific program for epic song collection in the Western Balkans. 
Between September 16, 1886 and late November 1888, Marianovich and his team of scribes made five trips to the Kraina, brought three singers to Zagreb for extended stays and, of song collection and public performances, and received a number of other songs sent in by various collectors. In total, the team amassed 290 epic songs and 30 lyric songs from only 13 singers amounting to a total of 255,388 verse lines. 50's, 50 of these songs were later published in full in two Croatian folk song volumes that Marjanovic uh, edited for Matica Hrvatska, as well as portions of, uh, or descriptions of 68 other songs that were in the, the appendices to the books. Sort of comparative material. Now, um, for the folklorists in the room, you've likely heard of Guslars because of the work of Melman Perry. And so for the most part, you know the singers are called Guslars and they sing their epic songs to an instrument called the Gusle, hence their name. And you probably know this fella here, Abdo Medjedovic. Oh. So it's a rudimentary fiddle that they sing epic songs to with a limited number of notes. That's why you can master it. But in the Kraina region, uh, which was sort of the first place where very long, extended, multi-episodic songs were collected before uh, uh, Perry and Lord found uh, Abdo Medjedovic down in Bielopolje, in, in sort of the border of Montenegro, Bosnia, and Serbia, um, they sing to what is called the two-string tamburica, or, or tambura. So this is also one of Perry's singers, Murad Junic. Uh, um, <clears throat> but the point is, is that it's a slightly different version of the tradition. And, and what's really important about these songs is they were much longer than the sort of shorter Christian songs that had been collected up until that time. Or Muslim songs co uh, collected from uh, Christian singers. Marjanovic was rigorous and exacting in his collection work and provided a wealth of data in the first volume's introduction. He gave biographies for the singers describing their singing styles and techniques, as well as their artistic influences. He included high quality photographs of four of the singers, and even relayed minor details about the projects, such as the remuneration that singers received. Collecting a broad range of songs from a number of singers, including the complete repertoires of two, drawn from a single geographic region, provided Marjanovic rare insight into the craft. He was one of the first scholars to offer, offer systematic observations about song performance and to note that the texts of the songs were not fixed, changing between performances even by the same singers. These observations, gleaned unintentionally from empirical circumstances of the collection, had a foundational influence on the later researches of scholars like the uh, Slovene scholar Matija Murko, who they, then later influences uh, Milman Perry, and his uh, uh, helper and later heir apparent, Albert Lord, uh, who were able to test a series of increasingly complex hypotheses about the functioning of the art form in the age of sound recording technology. So Matija Murko was recording onto wax cylinders, whereas Perry, very famously, uh, because he knew John Lomax and learned about the new technology that was coming out, brought tons of aluminum discs and a machine that had two uh, phonographs on it so that he could seamlessly flip between them and keep swapping the discs and so collect a complete song. And those are all at Harvard. You can go listen to them, and they're pretty amazing. Marjanovic's project was heralded at the time for its academic rigor and careful attention to conveying the true art of the singers. It was quite a shock then to later scholars reviewing his manuscripts to see the extreme level of redaction and rewriting he had applied to the songs he had published. Like the great collectors before him, Marjanovic still followed an editorial imperative to refine the rough-hewn songs of peasant artists in service of literary tastes. Despite some of his own claims to the contrary, he took great liberty to rearrange large portions of the songs, to ease and clarify narrative flow, and was also clear in many of his writings about the role that a collector must serve in training singers how to dictate their songs correctly. 
Albert B. Lord would later write of Marianovich, I have not seen any better proof of the existence of two poetics, one for oral traditional poetry and the other for lit, uh, written literary poetry. And yet the majority of Marianovich's concerns were stylistic. He was steadfast in producing a concise and unencumbered narrative and felt at liberty to intervene on those grounds. On the other hand, he seldom applied corrections to song content, and then always most subtly and judiciously, with the aim of interfering in the world of the epics as little as possible. It is thus surprising that the one issue that vexed him most in Ceausevich's songs was geography. So, in 1887, a young teacher named Dragutin uh, Hirtz, who would later become uh, an esteemed botanist, mountaineer, and academic, and he's one of the sort of surprises of my uh, research to find this very famous, well-known Croatian figure actually played a seminal role in uh, this early project. Uh, he took a job as a youth at the state penitentiary in the northern Croatian town of Lepoglava, providing a foundational education to the inmates. Newspaper reports describing Marjanovic's project in Zagreb and the singer Mehmet Kolakovic, visit, uh, uh, his visit to Zagreb, prompted Hirtz to inquire among the Bosnian inmates in search of his own epic singer. One of his students informed him of a young Bosniak singer, uh, Ahmed Ceausevic, who was tasked with chopping firewood for the prison. Hirtz sent pen and paper to the singer, along with the request for his songs, uh, only to receive a written response from Ceausevic, who had only learned to uh, write in prison, that he knew many songs, but was not up to the task of committing them to paper himself. Unable to dedicate the time required to record them, Hirtz abdicated his claim to the singer to a young law student named Mato Križević, who was working as a private tutor to the prison's direct, uh, prison director's sons. Križević contacted Marjanovic and sent him the titles of the first two dozen lines of 13 of Ceausevic's songs, only two of which were variants of songs collected from Kolakovic. The quality and novelty of the songs revealed a worthy singer, and on uh, January 20th, 1888, Matica's executive board allocated funds to Križević uh, and Ceausevic to begin transcription. But who was this young singer? So this is a modern picture today. Ahmed Ceausevic was born in 1863 in the village of Brekovica, just northeast of Bihać. At the age of 14, the singer began to learn heroic songs, first from his father and his older brother Alia, and later from two brothers-in-law, Hasan Majetic, a native of Ostrožac, which is a nearby village, and Ahmed Samarjic of Mutnik, who married his sister Hanka. Ceausevic quickly gained proficiency in the art of singing to the two-string tambura, a simple Eastern-derived lute-like chordophone that characteristically accompanied epic singing in the region. He spent his work days farming his family land with his older brothers Ali and Omer, but in his spare time, he tra uh, traversed the territory between Bihać and Tsazin, and so I put a little red box kind of roughly where he's moving about, uh, and learning from other singers. In the summer of 1881, Ceausevic's parochial circumstances were irrevocably altered when he committed what is only described as a teški zločin, a grievous crime, leading to his incarceration. He stood trial in Sarajevo and received a sentence of 10 years on September 21st, 1881. Since there were no closed type prisons in Bosnia, uh, in the newly occupied Bosnia, Austrian authorities transported Ceausevic to Lepoglava prison in Croatia on November 16, 1882 to serve his sentence. In 1886, with the opening of the today infamous uh, Zenica Penal Correc Correctional Institution, this lovely building down here, or KPZ, Kape Dome, it's really famous today for where um, during the communist or the socialist period where all the sort of belligerents were sent to if they didn't go to Goliotov to break stones with a hammer or disappear into the forest. But, uh, the process was initiated to transfer Ceausevic along with his fellow Bosnian inmates closer to his home region uh, to finish his sentence. In 1888, with this transfer date looming, there was a rush for Križević to collect as much material from Ceausevic as he could. Funds from Matica and appeals to the prison director freed Križević and Ceausevic from their duties, and eight long-format epics were recorded before Ceausevic was transferred, somewhere around March 10, 1888. As prisoner number 45, Ceausevic finished the last three years of his sentence at Capizé and was released on September 21st, 1891, at which time he disappears completely from the historical gaze. Unfortunately. 
Uh, no, uh, the mosque in Brekovica retains no marriage, uh, birth, or death certificates from this era. I have been un unable to find a grave marker for him in the oldest graveyards in the village, and no memory of him remains in the oral histories of the contemporary families in the town that bear his surname. And there's a lot of them. It's one of these small villages where there's four names that everybody has. <coughs> Hirtz described the singer at 25 as having a pleasant appearance, brown-skinned with small black mustaches and bright black eyes. Despite Chaushevich's scandalous position in society, Križević described him in positive moral tones, painting a picture of a gentle soul who had been the victim of an unfortunate event. The jurist wrote, as the prison warden himself attests, that youth is one of the most upstanding convicts. Sincerity, a soft heart, and an honest soul are revealed in each and every one of his words, and it can be truly said that only an unfortunate incident has driven him to this hapless position. The distinguishing characteristic of this 25-year-old singer, though, was the considerable length of his songs. Križević collected eight songs from the singer, totaling 23,195 verse lines, an average length of 2,899. In comparison, the Christian songs usually don't break 1,000. Very rarely you get sort of 1,500. With three of his songs breaking the 4,000 line uh, mark, and the longest song comprising 4,447, the longest epic song collected in the Western Balkans before Milner Perry's research. Chaushevich's songs can best be described as the product of a highly gifted but still unrefined epic singer. He regularly employs standard formulaic language and is prone to reusing mundane lines with little variation and extended repeti uh, repetitive episodes. That said, his ability to perform extremely long songs is a testament to an artist who is learning to flesh out his stories and give their plots sufficient time to breathe and captivate their audience. While some of his singing is composed of simple elaboration, Many songs boast long sections of competent and dynamic singing, including a number of short passages graced with dramatic touches and surprising flourishes of poetic genius that are unique to his telling. These have the effect of bringing an air of realism to the scenes, inserting flashes of unexpected humor, or captivating the listener with remarkably descriptive and detailed vignettes full of subtle, insightful, uh, and insightful glimpses of recognizably human behavior. The notable aspect that concerns us today, though, are, uh, or the notable aspects, are twofold. Firstly, his songs were not collected by Marianovich's team, and so he was not coached to sing the songs properly. And thus, editorial changes were only applied to the largely accurate transcription of his dictated verse. Secondly, Chaushevich had an odd tendency in his songs of plucking Bakoni Mountain up there beside Budapest in Hungary, uh, which is called Bakonia in Croatian and Bosnian. Uh, from out of Hungary and moving it down to the Lika region of Croatia. And this is roughly where I've kind of, uh, reading all of his songs, I can sort of coordinate where it sits. Marjanovic was impressed by the length of Chaushevich's songs, but the stylistic methods employed to produce that length, namely parallelism, rep repetition, and elaboration, offended his sensibilities. The exceptional lengths of his finest songs also pose practical impediments for publication in two already oversized volumes of very long Bosniak songs. Marjanovic extensively revised and edited Chaushevich's transcriptions with the aim to publish them, but ultimately the songs were relegated to the archive. What is somewhat surprising, though, is the amount of ink Marjanovic spilled railing against Chaushevich's moving of Bakunia. So let's talk about epic geography. The vast majority of Bosniak epics are set in the early modern period, when the Ottomans still retain most of their greatest territorial claims in Europe. So we, our major players here are the Austro-Hungarian Empire up there in orange, and the Ottoman Empire in green. The vast majority of Bosniak epics are set in the, uh, oh, I just said that. They are usually divided into two categories, focused on the wars, weddings, and cross-border razias of Christian and Muslim heroes and villains. The most abundant are the Kraina or, and Lika songs. No, or Lika songs. Sorry, messing up. That regard the border that separated Ottoman controlled Lika. So, I don't have a pointer. It's kind of up here. The Kraina is over here, Lika is over here. And then they divide the, uh, the border, which here is at sort of its fullest extent. They're really pushing the Venetians out here. Uh, Zara here is Zadar today. 
Uh, this area here is Ravni Kotari. It's good to remember that because all of these songs are about fighting between Lika and Ravni Kotari. The lesser category is the Hungarian songs, which concern battles between Ottoman-controlled Hungary, here with uh, Buda and Pest, which used to be two cities, um, as the centers of the uh, Ottoman territory up there, against uh, Vienna and a few other major centers in uh, Austro-Hungary. Since the heroes of these songs often travel great distances, epic geography plays an important role in orienting listeners in unfolding events. For less skilled singers, geography is often very minimal and fanciful. They just go to like the hill and they go to the, the river. Um, or they go to like uh, uh, Pine Hill and it could be anywhere, right? In the highly elaborated and extended songs of skilled singers, it takes on a heightened level of accuracy. Here, directions of travel between two points are given specific itineraries of geographic progression, which mark both real and imagined mountains, springs, rivers, defiles, crossroads, fields, imperial boundary markers, and other features. Some singers even employ multiple routes between certain major points. And so this very quickly is a map I've whipped up on, well, this one took a little more time, on Google Maps. And these are mountains that exist in the real world that we can link to mountains in the songs. Uh, and so some of them, this here, this whole area here is actually a mountain range, Velebit, but the ranges are always discussed as though they're a single mountain in the epic tradition. And then we have a few like uh, Kunovats, which is, is probably Kunara mountain in the songs. And we have two strong contenders for where these might be. The itineraries appear to have been adopted through inheritance and were likely cultivated in the same manner as the art of singing. A young singer probably learned them from his earliest teachers and then refined and adapted them based on information derived from the songs of others. Given that many peasant singers lived fairly sedentary, regionally bounded lives and were most often minimally or uneducated, it is understandable that proximate geography reflected higher degrees of accuracy than more distant locations. So you get to see one of my ugly maps now. I just made that yesterday. Forgive me. <laughs> Despite this, many singers reveal startlingly accurate geographies for quite distant realms. The general rule is that the Kraina singers knew travel within the Kraina, so that's the red area there, and the easternmost region of Lika, that's the maroon, and sometimes some of the Kordun region uh, in black there, just above it. Mental maps of other parts of Bosnia varied by singer, while in general they consistently broke down in Croatia towards uh, Ravni Kotari, which is in the west there in purple, uh, the city of Karlovac, just north, um, the, uh, and Slavonia, and beyond it, Hungary to, oh, so this is northwest, I guess, and, and here's Slavonia, and then Hungary above. And at this point, we get major centers, but nobody knows where they are, and there's all sorts of sort of imaginary places that don't exist on a map that also gets uh, slotted in here. So many smaller geographic nodes in these distant and inaccessible realms were tradition dependent, not easily attributed to real locations and likely often invented. Competent singers memorized and consistently redeployed in performance specific itineraries for various directional movement between sites within their songs. This presents a considerable challenge. Not only did these itineraries often include an extended series of nodal points, the strict order established in the first singing needed to be retained in subsequent plotting. This made them perhaps even more of a challenge to the singer's skill than other elaborate formulaic features of the oral art, such as traditional themes of caparisoning or uh, donning disguises. The itineraries needed to be memorized both forwards and backwards for excursions and return trips, and plot events such as ambushes, skirmishes, or encounters with various characters often prompted tangential action which disrupted movement through the list and required competent resumption when travel continued. Singers also often estimated uh, distance of travel on horseback by hours, days, or nights, and occasionally on foot between nodal points, and injected these assessments into songs. These estimates vary in their relative accuracy, but some singers were actually quite skilled at this too. Another notable addendum to these itineraries, which we'll factor into the argument later, is the use of a common theme or pattern scene, I'm using uh, Lord's language of themes, in the Muslim tradition. Epic songs in the wider Western Balkans often include a trope where a hero crossing a mountain or other wild place hears animal calls or sounds, usually a wolf, 
that startle his horse, which he must then comfort. So let's call this the animal call theme. There's a more elaborate, refined, and specific version of this theme sung in the Kraina and Herzegovina. In these, night falls on a traveling hero. He is invariably on the peak of a mountain when this occurs, and most often on the tallest mountain in a specific itinerary. The mountain generally also bears the boundary marker between two empires. The chosen mountain can shift between singers, but the majority agree in the Kraina songs the journey from the city, uh, from cities like Udvina and Velika Kladusha, so on the uh, Muslim side of the border, to Zadar, crosses the imperial boundary on the peak of either a mountain called Vuciak, and this is terribly difficult to place because every mountain is called Vuciak. I've listed as many as I've been able to find. It just means where the wolves are. Um, and the kind of, a uh, hundred years ago there was a scholar who tried to tackle this, and he put his best guess here. But uh, I found two second features that look like they're much better aligned on the uh, uh, path. So uh, this pink number 10 is, is my guy. I'm going with it. <laughs> or else they cross over uh, the mountain called Kunara. And I said before, that's probably one of these two Kunovatsis here. And again, I'd go with number two because it's down. Uh, well, we'll get to that. In the Hungarian songs, it is predominantly Bakonya that is traversed and carries the border marker for heroes from Ottoman Buda making their way to Habsburg Vienna, or else some other sites like the possibly invented city of Janjok. And when my article comes out, I've got some discussion about that too. You're going to love it. <laughs> In the Bosniak animal call theme, when night falls, a series of animals, most commonly a wolf, bear, and a raven, but also sometimes cuckoos, uh, squirrels, and other beasts, call out and a, uh, the hero must react by either calming his horse, traversing ahead despite the frightening atmosphere, or in one of Ceausevich's poetic extrapolations, read the noises as an augury of the army's fate. This central position of Vuciak in the Lika songs and Bakonya in the Hungar Hungarian songs is the foundation of Ceausevich's error. So, Bakonya Mountain appears in five of Ceausevich's eight complete songs. As Marjanovic bemoaned, the singer always placed it in the Lika region uh, and, in fact, gave it primacy in his itinerary for travel between the Muslim and Christian realms. As with Vuciak for most other singers, Ceausevic situ situates the imperial border marker at or near Bakonya's peak and most often deploys his animal call theme somewhere along its length. There are no less than five points in the manuscript where Marjanovic uh, wrote extended comments about this error how the collector Križevic failed to correct the singer, how the quality of the song would be much improved were it not for this glaring mistake, and how best he might go about correcting it for publication. Given the positive support and guidance Marjanovic offered in his correspondence with Križevic, the frustration in these editorial notes is surprising. This is partly due to Križevic's failure to competently implement Marjanovic's detailed collection instructions, but it also reveals much about Marjanovic's editorial ethic. So this is, this is all just why. Why does he move this? <laughs> Marjanovic edited stylistic concerns in a literary manner, but in approaching content, he was trying to understand the dictates of the tradition and to edit in line with them. Many other common factual errors in the geography of the songs evaded his correcting by virtue of, the fa of that commonality. But because Bakunya was located in Hungary by other singers in line with factual geography, Marjanovic was unable to accept an anatopism that felt antithetical to both rational logic and the mores of the tradition itself. Marjanovic assumed this error to represent ignorance on the part of the singer and never questioned its origin, or, uh, nor why it was allowed to persist while Ceausevich was immersed in a traditional milieu. This dedication to the tradition also faltered when Marjanovic proposed a remedy to his problem. He recognized that Ceausevich was using Bakonya where others uh, deployed Kunara or Vuciak, but Ceausevich also included those mountains in his main itinerary. While Ceausevich's songs were being considered for publication, Marjanovic proposed to remedy the Bakwanya problem by substituting it for the coastal mountain range Velebi. So we just talked about that here, the long one along the coast there. The proposition made logical sense. The tail end of the real Velebi range runs directly through the border between Lika and Ravnikotari, producing a dramatic descent down to the seaside. Velebi was used in the epic tradition but never by Ceausevich, so no redundancies would be produced. 
And Ceausovic described Bakunia as a very high mountain, just like Velebit, which contains the third highest peak in Croatia. This remedy was logical, but unfortunately an affront to the tradition. Here, the editor's imperative demanded that two wrongs could make a right. Krajina singers do occasionally include Velebit, but consistently locate it, again as a single mountain, not a range, in a more northerly position, always linked to the town of Lichkinovi, which is some, around here, near Gospic. It belonged to a different itinerary than the path from Urbina to Zadar, and would have demanded a tangential and non-traditional divergence from the direction of travel in all of Ceausovic's songs. So rather than follow Marjanovic to hasty reproach and editorial intervention, let's return to Ceausovic's songs, bring Bakunia back to the Lika Kotari border, and then ask how it got there, and why it was allowed to stay in the span of four years spent performing in a traditional singer's milieu. The first step in approaching the problem is to understand the idiosyncrasies of Ceausovic's singing. Ceausovic was not well versed in the wider geography of the Western Balkans, or even his own home region. His epic verse need not take us to far off Dalmatia or Hungary to offer geographic inaccuracies, but only 33 kilometers north of his home in Brekovica to the city of Velika Kladusha. So this is Brekovica here, there's Velika Kladusha up there just right on the border. The third song in his manuscript is a common one in which the famous hero uh, Muyo Hernica and his oath brother compete to kidnap the daughter of Malta's viceroy. As a prize to decide who will marry a Bosniak maiden, both have been courted. After the quest is proposed, Muyo returns to his home in Veli uh, Kladusha to dress in Christian, Christian disguise and sets off for Malta. Before traversing the boundary between the Kraina and Lika, though, Muyo goes on this rhetorically linear but geographically circuitous excursion. So he's up in Kladusha, then he comes down to Šturlić, then he goes to Tržac, then he goes back up to Liskovac, and then he goes up to Cetingrad there. So uh, Šturlić, Liskovac, and Tržac are uh, names that are known to Ceausovic, but their spatial relationship to one another is unclear. On the other hand, Cetinacarska, today Cetingrad, is not a known site for him, and he assumes that it's located down to the south. So uh, he thinks he's sending his hero to the, uh, to the ocean side, but he's actually pretty much returned him home. Knowing that the singer's knowledge of geography was limited to his very close surroundings in the Vihaj area, we can first understand that he was entirely dependent on the songs for his itineraries. This means that Bakonia was as abstract a place to Ceausovic as were Malta, Zadar, and likely even nearby Karlovac and Udvina. A Kraina uh, performance milieu, however, should not have taught him to put Bakonia on the path to Zadar. Marjanovic's star singers were from the wider Bihać region, but never made this error. Even the singer Hasan Majetic, from whom Marjanovic uh, uh, collected eight complete songs, and Ceausovic noted him as one of his teachers, um, he never makes this substitution. So, whence this habit? A survey of the wider Bosniak epic singing provides uh, the answer. Ceausovic's artistic lineage must pass through one of the four singers who taught him the art, and then south to the region of Herzegovina, which is here down in light blue. We could make an even stronger case for this uh, if we had the collection locations from uh, this uh, character, uh, a very early uh, Bosnian folklorist, Ivan Jukic, who um, has a song, where am I? He has a song that includes the Kabila flying over again, but we don't know where it belongs. And he also includes uh, a sort of second-tier mountain. There are a number of singers that use the mountain Lashakovica, uh, including Kolak and uh, Islamovic. But uh, in Ceausovic's songs, Lashakovica has uh, undergone metathesis, and it's become Shalakovica. And the only other collection I've found that name in is also one of Yukic's. And I, I, I'm under the impression that these are all songs that have come out of Herzegovina. So, a convincing case can be made to present Ceausovic as a young singer who's still perfecting his craft and adopting his primary itineraries from a regional tradition that is adjacent to, but removed from his native home. What seems at first glance a minor revelation, in fact, allows for the fault of the error to be hung on the tradition rather than on the individual singer. This frees analysis uh, to approach Ceausovic on the terms of the tradition itself, using emic criteria. So despite the misplaced mountains within his songs, Ceausovic's itineraries between Udbina and Radnik Potari are actually largely consistent. 
Nearly every one of his songs involves movement through this pathway. Uh, and although the geography is flawed, and we don't really know exactly where everything goes, uh, the action is always consistent. He moves through Vuciak Mountain, which is always close to Udvina, except for in one situation where it's up above, but uh, we know who taught him this song, and it's the exact same. Uh, that singer puts it there, so he's learned it from him. After that, in every song, the heroes go through Vukovica, Shalakovica, Bakonya, where they cross the border, and then they come to Kunara, which might be in one of these two locations. And if you remember back to my slide for the known locations, uh, this is very much a, a plausible place for it, before they head down into Ravnikotari or Zadar to fight their enemies. Chaushevich would not have known this, but his placement of the border is unexpectedly consistent with the historical Venetian Ottoman border of 1683. Topographically, his naming of mountains in, in uh, Serbo Croatian, you can, some mountains are known as high, high mountains that are sort of rocky and craggy, and other ones are low and forested mountains. And he also ascribes these to his various mountains, and it fits really closely the actual topography there. So, this is actually on the ground. Uh, we're just outside of Udbina here, just to the north, on a field that's called Krbava Field. It's a very famous place where there was a terrible battle between the Croats and the, and the Ottomans. Uh, and in the distance, you can see the Velovit Range over there. And as you drive towards the coast, you hit exactly where he's talking about low mountains. We have low mountains. Then, as you get closer, you can see sort of the drastic uh, rise of Velovit. And then you come drastically down through the mountains and to the uh, seaside into Ravikotari. And this is on the ground where I think um, Vuciak lives and for Ceausevich Bakunia. There's a, there's a famous uh, site here, uh, Tulove Grede, and just over here or behind it is Vucia Draga, which is uh, the site I've sort of picked out. While he does move Bakunya from its proper place to the lo uh, location where most singers place the mountain Vucha, his constant grouping of Bukovica, Shalakovica, and Bakunya reveals that he did not muddle the itineraries of his Krajina peers, but rather borrowed the entire set from the singers who first taught him the art. He was thus serving the central ethic of traditional epic singers, to faithfully pr reproduce the songs as he heard them. We can imagine that had Ceausevich never committed his crime and remained in Brekovica, he would have progressed as a singer. Other singers would have heard him perform, might have felt that the order seemed wrong, but likely would not have publicly or personally critiqued him since both Bakuni and Ravni Kutari lay in territories most had never visited. Their unease would be laced with doubt, but if pressed to comment on the discrepancy, most singers would likely follow Mehmet uh, Kolakovic and say, oh, where'd he go? I got behind. I sing the song as I heard it and learned it. He might have grown to hear songs from other singers, and he might have ad uh, adapted his itinerary because of it, uh, or he might have stuck very uh, firmly with uh, the placement of mountains as he had learned them. And perhaps this is exactly what he did after he left the Zenitsa prison in 1891 and regained his freedom, but we shall never know. What is certain, however, is that Ceausevich's placement of Bakonia was perhaps perplexing, but traditional, even if Marjanovic did not recognize it as such. Sorry, I did some last minute editing in that one. We can also learn a lot about Marjanovic as an editor, and particularly the logics that he employed in his decision, make, uh, decision making as an editor. He was an exemplary collector for his time, but he reveals an unspoken principle in academic analysis of epic in the 19th century. The ongoing demand to see oral traditions as folk literature meant that a bellatristic criteria of quality continued to be applied to the art. Um, there's also a similar, uh, though oppositional, uh, perspective that demanded that the songs always serve an educational role as the primary vehicle for historical knowledge, and with it geography and topography among the folk. In both cases, while the greatest singers could come close to that expectation, all needed some intervention from the editor to achieve it. 
Folklorists of the 19th century strove to grasp the workings of the tradition as it existed, but the fact that there were singers of varying skills and that we had these theories about the degradation model meant that uh, editors felt that there was sort of a, an opening when somebody moved away from the tradition for sort of carte blanche uh, editorial intervention. And in fact, it's interesting that there were people at Matica Herbatska who reviewed uh, Marjanovic's publications and actually contested how much editing he was doing and, and were fighting back and there was a dialogue going on within the publishing house itself. <laughs> Importantly, Marianovich's inability to distinguish between singular errors in performance and consistent errors that signal deeper traditional logics foreclosed his access to the insights of his successors. So, specialists in the field know that Mattia Murpo, uh, Milman Perry, and Albert Lord, their researches were not free of bias. Um, they had their own sort of impositions on the singers and what they did in performance. There were poor collecting habits, although none of them come close to the sort of interventions that Marjanovic uh, uh, pushed. And we might see this as sort of a continuum of, okay, you know, the, the technology is getting better, we're able to look at the art a little bit better, and because of that, uh, the, the exploration of the art uh, is improved. But uh, in some ways, <clears throat> it's about the fact that Marjanovic refused to look at the form as something. He, 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 had, he focused on the art, the sort of traditional world of it, and the performance aspect, but the form of the songs to him was still sort of just being whipped out at random. And because of that, he sort of felt, uh, he sort of missed out on the opportunity to uh, gain the insights that, that later scholars uh, gathered by actually looking very specifically at form. Also, while Marjanovic's editing is not quite as pernicious as some of the sort of earlier scholars that approached it, he still had a real love of this art form. He loved his singers and he really uh, strove to kind of uh, convey their songs as they were singing them. We see sort of the unsightly remnants of romantic era views of the folk as mere vessels for ancient lore in his interventions here, and particularly when he moves his reproof away from uh, Ceausevich as the singer and to Križević as the collector, where, uh, you know, he's saying, you know, this is the naive voice of the collective, and they need to be sort of trained to do it right. He sees these interventions as sort of the, the helpful imposition of an aficionado, when in fact this is exactly how these traditions broke down and sort of disappeared. There's also a, pow a power dynamic implicit in this, right? There's a young, rural, largely illiterate singer who uh, you know, is approached by a, a, a gentleman from the city, and we can imagine that if Križević had actually taken on Mario Marjanovic's approaches, that he'd go, oh, I, wa I want to talk to you, I want to get your songs. He's giving him importance for the fact that he does this singing, only to then tell him, you're doing it wrong, go back, do it again. Um, that you, you can imagine how much of an effect this would have on the singing itself or his, you know, uh, desire to engage in the process at all. So luckily, you know, we have these original materials and we can go back to Ceausevich's performance. Uh, Marjanovic was also very helpful in that he recorded his singers and then he made copies that he edited. So we can at least go back and undo the editing that he did for the published versions, but we can't go back to the collection moment and undo the training of the performers, uh, which makes, even though Križević didn't really know how to collect songs and he made a few errors, he had no idea how to write Bosnia, uh, Bosnian words or anything, we still have a cleaner version of this song because of the fact that the, the scholar, who, you know, this is his life work, uh, uh, isn't there collecting from this singer. So, by going into the archives, by digging up these sort of lost people, we can sort of grab Marjanovic's pen before he scratches everything out. Uh, we can bring back Bakonya, and then we can ask sort of importantly, why is it here? Why has it been moved? What does it mean to move that? And what does that tell us about both this singer as an individual, uh, how epic geography works, and how that can tell us a lot about how people learn the songs? Um, <coughs> And we get to hear some cool songs, which unfortunately are so long that I can't, <laughs> I can't bring in sections of it for you to look at, because we'll be here for uh, a week. Anyways, hope I didn't put you all to sleep. Thank you.
minutes for some questions. Do you have anything in the audience to uh, ask? Yeah. Uh, you say that Chelsea songs are in the Harvard on the No, they're not. They're not recorded. This is a generation before Perry's work, so we have no, or actually two generations really, we have no recording technology, so these are only in manuscript document form. So songs are only just in the That's uh, Murat Junic, who's a, a singer from that same area singing in the same manner, but he was collected by Milton Perry. It's, it's, uh, uh, those digitized? Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are digitized. They've been at it for over 10 years, but it takes a lot of funding, a lot of time, and a lot of specialists, and the discs are getting uh, more and more garbled because a lot of people have uh, listened to them multiple times to be able to, to write everything down. So, uh, but there's a bunch of them online. The, the, the online archive uh, for the, the Perry archive, the, the online interface is, is great. Go online, type in Milman Perry archive, you'll be brought somewhere where you, I mean, it, it helps to know the language, to know what you're listening to, but there's great photos and there's uh, all sorts of stuff. Also, are there any like, official records of the heroic exploits that we find any uh, understanding about where the place is actually? Some of it. Some of the heroes in the songs are sort of too vague to be able to place with real people. And the ones that we do have real historical examples from, uh, they don't look anything like their heroic counterparts. And the sort of main Christian hero, Mark Mukradjevic, is the sort of prime example that he was a vassal to the Ottomans, fought in their wars for them, and died a very insignificant uh, uh, sort of death on a battlefield fighting the Romanians. Uh, but in the songs, he becomes this superpowered Hercules figure who still works for the Sultan, and it's actually really interesting that he has this internal strife all the time, that he works for his enemies, but he does so to try to protect his people. Um, but he goes on all sorts of adventures. Anytime the Turks make him angry, he sort of uh, enacts a bit of catharsis for the, the listeners of the song by grabbing them all and smashing their heads and beating them to death with an ox at the end of a plow and things like that. So, Sounds like the best part. It's, it's really fun. I'm not doing the fun stuff here. I'm doing the stuff that nobody's done yet. <laughs> so, but you all know a lot of mountains that you had no idea about before. <laughs> um, I have a question for you about the animal calls, understandably. Um, I'm curious if you look at thought about it, but it can only go really so far. So this place was rife with wolves, and in fact, Bosnia is the only place in sort of Europe proper that still has wolves, um, whereas everywhere else they've mostly been wiped out. But 100, 150 years ago, there were a lot more wolves there. So it makes sense that the mountains are all called where the wolves are, because it's good to know that information and not go there. Um, <laughs> but uh, as far as the rest of the animals, it's really just this one little spot. You get a few lines, and it's like, what's it, one thing that's maybe interesting is that most of the animals have their own sounds, and that those continue to this day. So, like uh, ravens, uh, caw, the grotayu, um, and uh, wolves howl, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's, it's really very surface level. They're, just, they're in a dark, spooky place, and they're heightening that sort of spooky element by the fact that the sun goes down suddenly the horse is getting spooked and all these random animals start coming out. It's funny that squirrels are in, included and different things like that, but it's just, you know, poetic language. Yeah? You alluded um, along the way to, I think, something like a theoretical discussion about the geography among epic scholars. Could you give us a little taste of the debates that we see you? They just, like, don't exist. There's, they're there, but they're so... You have scholars a hundred years ago that it was a lot like how, oh, we have these epic characters, let's find the historical people. There was a lot of discussion of just, okay, this mountain has a generic name, where is it? And they'd try to do some searching, and that's mostly in just like Serbian and Croatian academic articles. And then for the most part, uh, beyond that, that sort of, those discussions sort of stop as like, okay, we found as many as we can find. There's a couple of the mountains on the map I made that have been found later because of archaeological digs. And they've found like um, tablets that have something written on it. And it's like, oh, this is where they used to call this mountain that, but now it has a new name. Uh, but other than that, the only places you get geography discussed are usually like published editions of uh, epic songs. 
And then you just have somebody sort of mapping it out so that they can say these are the known sites that are real, but the singer says it's here and really in, in reality it's about 100 kilometers north of there, et cetera, et cetera. And then you, know, you have people like Arthur Haddo who used to do that kind of work. A lot of the uh, Balkan scholars did that. Uh, but really Dan Pryor's article is the only one I know that's actually sort of taking it from a new angle and, and the extra fun of let's jump on a horse and follow these things. Um, and he was able to find some interesting, uh, not only about the epic geographies, but also the geographies of where some of the songs were collected through that exercise. Just to pitch in uh, on your, um, the meaningfulness of the place names to people and how they resonate in the tradition. And uh, I just remember a bit um, from Amy Lord where he says, you know, the, Episodes are meaningful. Um, one hero who is described always as coming from this river, and it's this, if I, if I remember this correctly, it's this really winding river. He was a shifty character. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Lord sort of hinted at what you're saying, that yeah. this is a really meaningful, um, part of tradition that uh, Ben is so evocative. But what I wanted to, to say is um, uh, I really, it was really helpful to understand how um, people actually were blind on the, the fact that it was the Muslim singers who had the most extensive songs, the most, you know, epically elaborate Ones, and that your particular editor of despicable <laughs> principles um, was partly caught in this, that his paradigm was the Serbian ones that had been known ever since mm -hmm. Goethe uh, posted <laughs> it on his blog, so to speak. Um, and that's what people were familiar with. So he was looking at these and said, that's too long. Yeah. <laughs> so are you seeing this as the first kind of um, wow moment that scholars realized that if we really want to get the tradition, this is the group we need to look at? Definitely. And the thing is, is he's, I don't want to make him a complete villain. He's, he did some <laughs> amazing things. Uh, and he was very affected by the fact that the songs were so long and that they were longer than the Christian. There's a bit of like politics going on here too because this is the area where that at one point was part of um, the Croatian uh, kingdom. And they're trying, the Serbs on the east are trying to claim all the Muslims as Serbs who uh, took on Islam. And the Croats are like, oh, if we don't get in there, we'll lose all this territory to the Serbs politically. So they start, oh, our Croatian Muslim brothers um, and this is in Turkish Croatia. Uh, so there's a lot of other stuff going on with this. But um, he, he grew up in the area. We have an early published collection that he made. And it's interesting that he had to get a lot of his better understanding of the uh, scene on the ground sort of beaten out of him by the nationalists. And so in his first collection, he has, a, he has a footnote where he's like, I asked all the singers if these are Croatian songs, and nobody here knows the word Croatian. The, if you're a Christian, they call you a, a, a Magyar, a Hungarian, and if you're a Muslim, they call you a Turk. So nobody uses this nomenclature. They don't know what a Serb is, they don't know what a Croat is. And then, you know, 10, 15 years later, he's making this big publication, and suddenly it's the Croatian songs of uh, the Muslim singers in Bosnia, the Muslim Croatians. So uh, it's almost like he's been, he's been taught to not see the, the situation that it actually is. He's got a better ethnographic look on the ground because he grew up a peasant in this region and yet he untrains himself and then takes on all this sort of later language. But it's the scholars that come after him, um, like uh, Alois Schmaus and these kind of German scholars that really latch onto his collection and go like, these are the songs that we should be looking at. Um, and everybody there is looking for our Homer, right from, you know, before Perry ever gets over there. Uh, and so this is the same thing. These are really long songs. These are the, the Homeric singers we have. But it's when it becomes repetitive that they're just like, nobody's going to want to read this. Um, he just did this. You know, he just put all his stuff on his horse, and then he went to a new town, took all it off, and then he put all the tack on again. We can just scratch that whole section out. And so it's trying to 
uh, it's trying to sort of cater to the readership they see in advance that's not going to have the patience for this stuff, rather than sort of a hatred of the art, although he sort of seems to see it as the singers just trying to sort of stretch things out and have a longer song than the last singer we recorded from, and doesn't really see that this is an active part of the tradition. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you sort of implied that the editor had like a team of people who he had like taught how collection should be done properly. So do you have any um, indication of who would have made up that team or the tr like materials that he would have used to train them or anything like that? Yeah, um, I don't know much about the training, but he pretty much just, he was a teacher at the university, he taught law, and he found sort of his, his best students and he was like, hey, come with me to the Balkan, or to Bosnia, we're gonna go record some stuff. Um, and he tried out a few people, brought them on one trip and then kicked them out because they were too slow writers. And he actually had a dear friend, uh, he was a lawyer named uh, Petar Starcevic, and he became his like super best. He really trained him in how he wanted these collected and started actually sending him independently. And even though people like Grzevic sent uh, songs in and there were other people that went with him on trips, in the end the songs that he published were only songs that either he or Starcevic had collected. Um, and then there's also, there's locals on the ground there where he's making trips through and he finds a bunch of singers, but he's like, I don't have time, I can't stay here. And he would meet local um, nobility, mo Muslim nobility, who were like, that's okay, I'll um, either collect these from the singer and send them to you, you tell me what you want me to do, how to collect them. And if they're still junk, then we'll figure out a way to send them to Zagreb so that you can record them there. So a lot of it's just like nobody had any money for these kind of things, and getting enough money to make these trips happen was really a big undertaking. Um, and so, they have a lot of practical impediments, but he was really sort of strict on the way I'm doing it is the way it needs to be done, and if anybody else, I can't trust their collecting, because it's not, you know, under these strict, uh, and he, uh, it, when the article comes out, he attacked another uh, collector in Bosnia. He, he took like four, he wrote an article that spanned four issues of a journal, just going song by song, why you're a terrible editor, why your dictionary's no good. Um, and, and within that uh, sort of uh, screed, he also, he also talked about his sort of ethic, and I, you learn a lot about what he wanted the editors and collectors to do in that uh, article he wrote. Hi. I think you might have addressed this, and I missed it, so I'm sorry for making that I don't know. It's lost, but everything about these aspects of his singing that don't fit in there, I'm only finding in the South. And so, and that's the thing is, is uh, Marjanovic was critiquing him because he only knew the Kraina singers, and so he's like, nobody does this except for you, so you're screwing up. Whereas now we have all of these collections, well he had the Herman collection at his disposal, and he could have looked at that one, but he didn't or he didn't see that there were these parallels in it. Um, so I can't explain where it comes from, but there, there has to be some sort of line that's bringing these traditions up. And it's, they're in close proximity and people were moving back and forth in these regions. So it has to be that one of the people that taught him had learned to sing down south. So the singers themselves traveled? Some a lot, some a little. We have, uh, when we have biographical information, I'd say about 70% of them stayed in one place and just traveled very locally. As long as they could find enough, uh, they're not, this isn't their day job, right? They're just singing and, and getting like drinks and coffee and cigarettes. Um, so they're usually just performing at their local cafe on their weekends and things like that. But there's a few of them and it's usually tied to what their job was. A few of them were merchants, so they moved around a lot. Some of them went to war and so they traveled with their battalion and they met other singers and they sang together. Um, and then a very, very sort of uh, select few of them uh, were sort of just well-traveled for who knows what reason, or they were merchants and they had to go from town to town and they performed their art elsewhere and heard other songs and brought them into their uh, repertoire. Thank you. 